people turned out in the streets of Baghdad today to say U.S. out. That's the, that's the real news. And we're also meeting at a time where the Venezuela embassy protectors, they've been in the streets in Venezuela at a time where there were hundreds of thousands, and I want to say I was there with them some of those times, hundreds of thousands of people in the streets against the U.S. attempted coup. So it's people's power. And it's going to be reflected tomorrow. There's a demonstration in Columbus Circle. I bet everybody's heard about it at least. Now, whether it rains or snows tomorrow, it's happening in 210 cities now around the world. And it's kind of incredible, because that's not a word in the corporate media. First off, I really want to thank the Embassy Protector Defense Committee. Um, Sarah and Margaret are uh, members of that defense committee, and it has been so important for us in facing these uh, charges, these federal charges, that there are people who are organizing to support us uh, during this time. And I also want to thank all the other members here who came down to the embassy, because when we talk about the Embassy Protection Collective, it's huge. It was hundreds of people. There were, you know, we did public events inside of the embassy initially, like every night we had educational or cultural events. And so many people came to those events. At the height of the uh, action, we had more than 70 people staying overnight in the embassy. And then starting on April 30th, when the pro-coup folks took the embassy under siege, and people were no longer allowed to come in, so many people came down and were supportive outside of the embassy. And I can just tell you for us that we know it was really scary for the folks who were outside facing the violence and the threats and the, just the racist, homophobic, misogynist behavior. Um, we were also a little scared inside the embassy because they kept trying to break in. And it, just seeing folks across the street they're keeping an eye on things, they're in solidarity, and some people who stayed out there all night, and some people who would help out, like when we heard weird noises and we couldn't see what was going on, and they would go and look, and it just, um, this was really a collective effort, and couldn't have happened without the participation of everybody. So I just want to keep that in mind, that this is a really big, when we say the Embassy Protection Collective, it's a very big group, and thank you so much to all of you who were part of it. In March of last year, we were part of the U.S. Peace Council delegation to Venezuela, and we arrived there as the power. They had this nationwide power outage, which they determined later on was a result of cyber, a cyber attack on their electrical grid. Go figure, the software was developed in Houston, <laughs> and they tracked the attack to Houston and Chicago. And then as they tried to get it back up again, there were these other attacks inside the country on the infrastructure that kept kind of knocking it out. So we were down there, and we were seeing in the U.S. news all this stuff about there was chaos in Venezuela, and it was crazy, and they couldn't get their power on, and we were down there, and a lot of the power was back. It would kind of come in and out. Um, but things were very calm. They were completely calm. People were just dealing with it. They were, oh, we heard that they were getting dirty water from the rivers because they couldn't get water. But Venezuela actually is one of the largest freshwater sources in the world, and they have a lot of springs. And so people were going to these natural springs and helping each other collect water. So all the things we were hearing in the media were really the opposite of what was happening down there. And that's that's just true, generally. If you hear something in the corporate media here about Venezuela, it's probably not true. Who failed in Venezuela? Really, he was a joke. And he would call a protest and nobody would show up, or he'd cancel it because he knew nobody was going to show up. And, and so really, the only way they could give the appearance of this coup succeeding was by, in the United States, making it look like it was real, right? So when we were down there, we saw that the UN consulate in New York was handed over to the coup people. And that the attache offices, the Venezuelan military attache offices in D.C. were handed over. And folks tried to get out there as soon as they heard what was going on and stop it from happening. And thanks to all of you in New York who were part of that. But they were on the outside, and police had already let them in. So there's not a lot you can do at that point. So in April, uh, April 9th, I think it was, of last year, the Organization of American States changed its rules 
so that they could force through a vote to recognize Wang Guaido as the president. Prior to that, the, the main role, the normal role they have is a two-thirds majority to recognize someone as the president of the country, and they couldn't get that. So they just changed the rules and said, okay, we'll go with a simple majority. So what kind of a message does that send to other countries that are part of the OAS? Like, if we don't like who your president is, we'll just change our rules and recognize somebody else. So that's, you know, we were there um, to try to stop the U.S. from violating international law. The Vienna Convention is very clear that embassies are inviolable. And we were there with the permission of the elected government. And we were there to try to hold that space while the United States and Venezuela negotiated for mutual protecting power agreements. Because this is traditionally what happens when countries break off diplomatic relations. They find a third country to be the protecting power for their embassy. And in fact, those third countries can offer what's called an intersection, and they can offer some diplomatic services. So this was the, you know, the, the solution that made the most sense. And it's that the U.S., I think, already has 26 protecting power agreements going on. So it's not unusual. And we knew that the U.S. had asked the Maduro government to recognize Switzerland as a protecting power, and Venezuela was trying to find a country. Eventually, they found Turkey that agreed to be their protecting power. And so we said, well, you know, once that agreement is in place, we'll leave. You know, things will be protected, and this will be a path towards peace. Because that would start, you know, it would not escalate the conflict, and it perhaps could start more negotiations between Venezuela and the United States to, to find a diplomatic resolution to what was happening. So um, that's why we were there, and also I think I can't speak without mentioning the fact that the United States has been waging war against Venezuela for two decades now, ever since the Bolivarian process began and the unilateral coercive measures or sanctions that the United States is imposing on Venezuela are illegal, they violate international law, they violate the United Nations Charter, and the Center for Economic and Policy Research estimated that in just two years, period 2017 and 2018, those sanctions contributed to the deaths of 40,000 Venezuelans. So sanctions are war, sanctions do kill, and they're still happening. And the U.S. is still trying to intervene, so it's really important that we do whatever we can to keep speaking out and demanding that the intervention and the sanctions stop. And I'll end there. Sanctions are war by other means and are deadly. That 40,000 people in Venezuela alone have been killed by U.S. sanctions. And for those of you who may not know, let me just explain a little. Uh, when the U.S. imposes sanctions on another country, they don't just say uh, that this country, that the United States won't do business with this country or that financial transactions are illegal. They sanction any other country that dares to do business with the targeted nation. And that means U.S. sanctions are international sanctions. So people in Iran, for example, are dying because they cannot access uh, cancer drugs. People in Zimbabwe, uh, Eritrea, I, there, Nicaragua, 30 some odd nations are under U.S. sanctions which are creating terrible suffering all over the world. To understand what's going on in the world and in other countries looking at history is very important. And looking at history in terms of Latin America and Venezuela, I always remember this quote by Simon Bolivar, over 100 years ago, um, of saying that the United States is destined to plague Latin America in the name of liberty. Right. And that, that same dynamic is still going on and seen it for so many years. I was in Venezuela, um, came back from Venezuela on a trip to investigate the, sang and the effects of the sanctions, and a week later I heard this webinar call saying, come and make history in the Venezuelan embassy. And uh, it just seemed like a natural thing to flow from what I saw in Venezuela, the injustice, uh, talking to farmers in tears at their, their jobs, their, they couldn't sell their products, couldn't get parts for their tractors, people who very worried about their families. They couldn't find medicines for their parents with heart failure and numerous, numerous other things. Um, and when I'm in San Francisco, and this is where I've been, my family and 
trying to talk to people, and uh, it seems like I have to start from the beginning. I know I don't have to with most of you, but to talk about, they, people have this notion that the United States job or role in the world is to defend democracies. It's just the opposite. It's to find them and crush them. Right. Any uh, country that takes an independent economic or political path, and Venezuela is a prime example of that. We've um, also, it's been important for me to explain that if you really step back, we are a gangster in the world. We are throwing our, no our government, not us, but our government, not obeying international law, uh, not obeying the charter in, of the United Nations and treaties that we've signed, and just basic plunder and theft around the world. And Venezuela, being the sort of epicenter of this struggle in Latin America, and the U.S.'s attempt to try to gain control politically and economically, Venezuela is the target. And we saw firsthand in my delegation that it's actually killing people. You don't see bodies lying in the streets, they're in the morgues of hospitals because they couldn't get medicines. They couldn't get dialysis equipment. And I know from working in a hospital for 30 years, you don't get dialysis, there's no other options, you die. For people to choose that, I don't know what to say. Um, and this, um, so much of this trying to get through to people who know little, uh, may be curious, but all they hear is um, what I often hear in San Francisco, Oh, I heard the Maduro that Venezuela is a horrible place. And where did you hear it? I heard on NPR. Yeah. Right. And that's where it stops. They don't look beyond that. Um, they never talk about the sanctions. They never say that our government is strangling the economy, blockading medicines and food getting in. And it's almost like, I mean, it's not exactly the same, but agencies in this country, you want to get rid of the EPA, you defund it. You take all the investigators away and then say, look, it's not doing its job, not doing any good. Got to get rid of it. For me, yes, it was worth it because um, those people were struggling. And I was so impressed with the, the, the dignity and determination of the Venezuelan people just to be free of this kind of coercive measures, these attacks, the threats, economic, psychological terrorism that's on these people. And I was so impressed and came back with a feeling of responsibility to um, hold our government accountable for these, for what they're doing to this country. Since that time, what we have seen is one after another after another coup in Latin America modeled after what I think is a sort of new kind of coup. It's a coup that's draped in constitutional legitimacy. Um, so that happened in Paraguay, of course, in Brazil with the coup against Juma, um, and you know now what's going on in Bolivia is just absolutely atrocious. But it's got this sort of legalistic veneer that is only possible with the full support of the United States government and the organization of American states, which itself has become a neoliberal fascist organization and nothing more. Now, one thing that I learned in those very few first few months that I was living in Washington, D.C., um, was the incredible importance of the interlocked organizations within that town, the think tanks, the universities, like my own, like Georgetown, George Washington, George Mason, that all function as centers of regime change operations, supporting and providing a, um, intellectual legitimacy for violent U.S. policy carried out in and against Latin Americans. Um, and sort of over the past decades, seeing the violence of my own colleagues in supporting regime change in against Venezuela, I mean, this has been an ongoing effort at American University, the Center for Latin American and Latino Studies, the Human Rights Program at the Washington College of Law, have time and time and time again invited incredibly violent leaders of the opposition to speak as if they were human rights defenders and have prevented anybody who has a different perspective from being incorporated in the conversation. And so that kind of violence, um, intellectual violence, which also you know, is masquerading as, as, as education, I think um, has 
really pushed me to a position where I recognize that just teaching, just um, teaching critical thought to my students is not enough. As educators, as academics, as intellectuals, public intellectuals, uh, uh, organic intellectuals, <laughs> academic intellectuals, we need to put our bodies on the line. Because the bodies of all of Latin America are on the line because of our policies, our government's policies that are funded by our tax dollars, and, um, and, and it's harming us as well. These same policies that are usurping democratic practices in Latin America are usurping our own democracy here in the United States and the hardest hit communities of our, our of course black and brown communities that are having their towns and their cities taken over by what do they call them the manager what happened in Flint um, emergency, emergency managers I mean this is what you see happening exactly what they're doing in Latin America is what they're doing to the, the most vulnerable um, and oppressed populations in the United States. You really got to see how the government controls the media with this. This is like a made-for-TV event. I mean, the conflict was every day for 37 days. You had this violent mob of racist, homophobic, anti-female, horrible uh, coup mongers. And you had these peace activists outside as well, conflict with them, us inside trying to bring the food up through the windows and through the garage. It was just, and the police helping the mob, the coup mob, is just crazy. I mean, postmen tried to deliver food and were stopped, you know, from delivering food for us. Amazon tried to deliver food and was stopped from delivering food. So it was, it was quite, but it was all blacked out. It wasn't until four embassy, four people arrested at Venezuelan embassy. That's the story. None of the context of 37 days and why we were out there. Or who we were. I mean, I, I, as, as I said, I was in Venezuela for the uh, election, uh, re-election of President Maduro, uh, and I, I was there with hundreds of election observers, more than 300 election observers. Uh, I was actually there more as they brought me down as media, a, a media group in, in California, uh, subsidized my trip to go down as a, a reporter. I never think of myself as a reporter, but people always tell me I'm a journalist. I, I, I don't think of myself that way, but uh, I appreciate that people see that. And uh, one thing that the 300 plus international election observers all unanimously agreed on was that election that all the standards of democracy under international law. Unanimous. And we call it a dictatorship. I've been an election integrity activist in the United States as well, working to end these unverifiable electronic voting machines. And I can tell you the Venezuelan elections are run much better than U.S. elections in many states. First, they have a 95% plus registration level. 95%, they're trying to get to 100%. Because the right to vote is in their constitution, unlike ours. And so they have to make that right something that people can actually exercise. So they actually, the government takes responsibility for registering people. Here, our government takes responsibility for deregistering people. <laughs> uh, and no matter how this case turns out, whether we end up in jail or end up acquitted, whether you get a fair trial or an unfair trial, we are going to use this federal prosecution to build the movement to stop this coup because Venezuela is not going to lose its independence. That's not you talking. That's the Venezuelan people talking. They will not lose their independence. And when they succeed, the Monroe Doctrine is finished. The end of U.S. domination of Latin America. That's what this is about.